somebody was supposed to be up here doing the robot during this, this week. Somebody promised me. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Nobody wants to see that, really. <laughs> okay, so there was this late, fr you know what I should say, first of all, we have some guest musicians here today, and we are so grateful that you are here. Thank you so much for being here. So um, there was this woman, and she traveled with her mother-in-law to Israel because they had had some issues. You know, they didn't get along that great, and so the whole family was, you can just take, oh, there you go. Okay. They were hoping that if they traveled together to Israel that this rift that was between them would be mended. I mean, the whole family was hoping that. But while they were over there, sadly, tragically, the mother-in-law died. And so the, um, the woman is making arrangements. And the undertaker says, for $2,000, just $2,000, such a deal, we'll bury your mother-in-law here in Israel. But if you want to ship her home, it's going to be twenty grand, $20,000. And the lady said, she is going home to America. And he's like, why? It's just two grand here. And she goes, you guys got a track record. You buried some guy. He came back to life. I can't take the chance. <laughs> All right? The whole purpose for that awful story, and I apologize to all the mother-in-laws in the room. I am a mother-in-law myself. The whole purpose is to say the relationships are hard. Aren't they sometimes hard? Um, whether it's a relationship with your in-laws or a relationship with your spouse or your roommates or a classmate or a bandmate or a coworker or a neighborhood uh, person or a friend, can we agree that relationships can be hard. Yes. Yeah. We're going to talk about some tough stuff today. It's just going to be some tough stuff that we're going to talk about. Um, as followers of Jesus, even in those hard relationships, we want to do more. I think, and, and I need you to talk back to me today, because I think that we want to do more than just survive. We want to thrive in our relationships. Am I right? Yeah. All right. Okay. So um, last week we talked about the importance of healthy loyalty in our relationships, and, and this healthy loyalty is built off of interdependence. You know, this idea that we're better together. We say that around here all the time. We really need each other. And so we don't want to aim for codependence. Nobody wants that. That is not healthy. We also, we can't be independent uh, one from another. Interdependence is, is the way of Jesus. It's the way of fellowship. It's why 12-step programs work. It's why all kinds of of movements in this world move and make an impact. It's because of interdependence. Now, this week, like I mentioned, we're going to take a critical and difficult subject, and we're going to talk about it, and it's, it comes into the life of every single relationship. <sighs> Are you ready to take on a tough topic? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because nobody... <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk about how the toilet paper roll gets hung. <laughs> now, we're going to talk about forgiveness. We're going to talk about forgiveness today. And we don't like talking about forgiveness because when someone has hurt us or we feel betrayed or we feel left out or, um, or we feel offended, we don't want to forgive. How many times I've sat in my office and heard the words, I will never forgive her for what she did. I will never forgive him for what he did. And um, it's hard to forgive. 
It seems impossible to forgive, particularly if it seems like we have a right to hold on to the thing that we're holding on to. Do you know what I mean? I mean, some things just happen in our lives, and, and they happen, and, and, and they're awful, and we have every right, like every right. But as followers of Jesus, we're called to a different way and a different response. And, and I'm going to say this. It, it came to me when I was preaching at the 830 service, and I'm going to say it now, and I'm going to probably say it again. When I extend forgiveness... I don't hold on and take the burden of the sin that was committed against me. Does that make sense? If a sin is committed against me, I don't want to take that on. But I do when I harbor bitterness, when I harbor anger, when I harbor resentment, when I let it fester and grow. Who's the sick one? It's me. I get sick mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally because of what someone else did. The way of Jesus is a way of freedom, and we're going to talk about that today. Um, There's a story uh, in the Bible that we're going to get to in a little bit, and it's going to teach us a better way to, uh, to respond when we are wronged. But you know what? <clears throat> we all respond to, um, to wrongs committed against us differently. Some plan retribution, how we're going to get even uh, when someone has hurt us or offended us or, or betrayed us. Sometimes we, we nurse that wound and we go tell people and we tell people and they say, oh my goodness, and it just It just builds up inside of us, and then some of us kind of live life at a slow boil until someone crosses us, and we blow up like Mount Vesuvius. That is a selfie taken last week of me. (laughs) Another response at the other end of the spectrum is uh, to write people off and just be done with them. No reconciliation, no forgiveness. We're just done. Uh, You may not know this, uh, but I have a brother. We were raised in the same home, same parents, a few years between us. And when I was about 20, he wrote me off because of my lifestyle, which admittedly wasn't great. But clearly things have changed. And after several attempts on my part, Um, When my father died, he wouldn't speak to me. When my sister died, he wouldn't speak to me. And and I've just come to the conclusion that it's easier for him to act like I don't exist than it is to have what might be a tough conversation but would lead to reconciliation, would lead to forgiveness, maybe not even lead to a a terrific relationship, you know, where we're calling each other on our birthdays, but to be able to, to turn loose of whatever it is. Reconciliation is the way of Jesus. Forgiveness is the way of Jesus. I mean, he came to earth, he hung on a cross to reconcile you and I to God so that we could have this open and free relationship with him. He came to make a way so that you and I could be forgiven for every single time that we have ever messed up and every single time that we will ever mess up. Thank God. Amen? I thank God for that. So Peter was uh, trying to make himself look good with Jesus, and he asked him a question that he thinks he clearly knows the answer to. I love Peter. Here's what it says. It's Matthew 18, 21, 22. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? I got this, right? Jesus says, no, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. I don't do math. How many times is that? That's a lot. 
right? I can imagine Peter's thinking about somebody that he's having a hard time forgiving when he asks this question. And by tossing out the number seven, Jesus will surely approve. But Jesus' response really isn't about a number. He uses hyperbole, um, exaggeration to say, in effect, the forgiveness of God is unlimited. The forgiveness of God is unlimited. Like I said, anything you've done, anything you will ever do, God will forgive you if you seek him and you ask him. So, what about us? We have been forgiven so much. He came to forgive us and to enable us to extend forgiveness to others so that we can live in freedom. And today we're going to look at wisdom from the Apostle Paul, and it's found in this little book. And I don't know if you've read it before, but it is an amazing story. It's power-packed. It's, uh, it's called the book of Philemon. And it's a story that's found toward the end of the New Testament, and it's super, super short. And, um, and I want to say that, first of all, it's a letter. It's written to a man named Philemon. Philemon is a slave owner. And Paul knows Philemon because a long time ago, Paul led Philemon to faith in Christ. So they have this bond. Paul is Philemon's spiritual father. So Paul's in prison writing this letter to Philemon, and he's in there for preaching the gospel, okay? Paul's, Paul is an outspoken preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've had it with him. They put him in chains. He's in a cell writing this letter to Philemon. Now, he's writing the letter on behalf of a runaway slave called Onesimus. Nobody names their kid that anymore. Onesimus is a runaway slave, and the slave master he ran away from is, you guessed it, Philemon. Only God could have orchestrated this. See, Paul administered to Philemon and led him to faith. Fast forward, Paul's in jail. He meets the runaway slave. He leads the runaway slave to Jesus, and now this runaway slave has to be returned to his master. It, it pains me to say those words. It really pains me to say those words. So Paul finds himself in this unique position. Philemon is, is his brother and his son in Christ. Onesimus, who has committed this crime against Philemon, is his brother and his son in Christ, and he has the horrible job of, of sending this runaway slave back home to his owner. Now we get to the letter. Paul's sending the slave home to his master with a letter. Paul is reaching out to Philemon to let him know he's sending Onesimus home out of duty. It's the law. This has to happen. And he is appealing to Philemon to not receive the runaway slave back in the way that he had every right to by law. He had every right to have him beaten or even killed. And Paul is appealing to him, don't do that. Don't do that. Now, I do want to say a couple things. There's a couple things that I need to talk about um, in this sermon this morning. One is slavery was a common practice in the uh, first century Rome. Uh, it's estimated that about 30% of 
The people in Rome were men, women, and children of all races, all ages, all creeds that were held uh, and sold as involuntary labor. It, it makes me sick. I know it makes you sick too, to think of people as objects. Well, the other part about that that's staggering to me is that throughout Christian history, people have said, well, there were slaves back then, and those people were Christians, and they used it to condone slavery. And guys, it wasn't all that long ago. So I just want to address that and say, Paul is not condoning slavery. But this was the reality of the situation then, okay? He is writing about a slave returning to a slave owner. He is writing about their current reality. And as we see, Paul is going to push his friend Philemon to make some choices that are going to change the world. And Paul gets really personal writing this letter, but the letter is addressed to a larger audience. So let's go ahead and look at the first part. This is a letter from Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. He makes sure that he knows that everybody who hears this knows, man, I am in chains for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So whatever y'all are going through, I got it worse. I'm in chains, and I'm still witnessing for Jesus. And then he writes to Philemon, his friend and his fellow worker, and also to the church that meets in your home. So he's writing the letter, but he wants to make sure everybody hears it, everybody in the church. So, you know, they didn't have um, buildings like this. Um, they didn't have worship in plain view then because people could be arrested and, and land in jail like Paul. So, in this room is Philemon, his family, his wife, his kids, his slaves, because they were all a part of the household, and other Christ followers in his community. So this is important because the challenge that Paul gives Philemon is done publicly. He's going to have to respond publicly, and, and Paul is calling him as a follower of Jesus to respond to everything differently, and man, does he lay it on. Let's look what, it, at what Paul writes. He says, I always thank God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people. Hmm, I wonder if all applies to a runaway slave. All his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus, and I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the body of Christ. He says, your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the heart of the Lord's people. Hmm. I wonder if a runaway slave who's accepted Christ, a runaway slave who has wronged him, will be considered one of the Lord's people. Paul begins this letter. He lavishly praises for uh, Philemon for the love he shows and for the fellowship that he has. And he publicly compliments Philemon for for his relationship with God and how well he takes care of everyone in the fellowship that's meeting in his home. You get, you get what he's doing, right? He's like paving the way. You're known for your love. You're known for your grace. You're known for your care. But there's, there's a little more on Paul's mind than just complimenting Paul or complimenting Philemon. But, you know, compliments go a long way. Who doesn't like them? We love them. It, it lights up our brains. But Paul's not even finished yet. Um, I love it when he says, um, go ahead and put that scripture up there. I want to I wanna camp on something for some. Um, it says, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective 
in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. So I want to camp on that word partnership for a minute. What Paul is saying is, hey, Philemon, we're partners in the gospel. We are in this together. Um, the word partnership in the original Greek is koinonia, and that means Christian fellowship and equal participation. What it means is that you and I are in this together. It means there's no big shots, there's no little shots, that we're in this together. We are partners with God, we're partners with each other, we're partners in all the ministry we do to share the gospel of Jesus with the world. You can go on to the next slide, Al. That's why around here we call people who want to be a part of this fellowship partners. You remember that old commercial, uh, membership has its privileges? Well, there's no privilege. It's a partnership. Arm in arm. We love together. We live together. We lead together. We serve together. We impact our community together. We're partners. We're partners with God. We're partners with each other. Any man, woman, or child that accepts Jesus as, as Lord of their life and chooses to follow Jesus day by day is his partner in the gospel. That's what we're called to. And so for this first century church that meets in Philemon's house, everyone, everyone has equal participation. Everyone here has equal participation participation. And we want to encourage you to take your place in the body of Christ here. Partnership in Christ is equal ground for everyone. And this partnership helps us all grow and learn and, and, and our faith gets deeper. Um, and these words of Paul are, are for us today as well as back then. And, and I want to say again, it takes the full participation of the body of Christ. We did a count one time how many people it takes to put the Sunday morning service on F for the whole week. How many people? And it takes 42. 42 people. And that's not even counting the folks that put breakfast on. All kinds of people contributing, all kinds of, of faithfulness, just everybody taking their part. And they're not doing it for praise. They're doing it to serve the Lord and to, to participate in the body of Christ. So I'm going to go back to the letter. At this point, it's just high praise of, of, uh, of the faith of Philemon. And like I said, Paul has more on his mind, Okay. He explains that he's met this runaway slave and that this runaway slave has been vital to Paul's ministry, that during the time that they're incarcerated together, they're in jail together, this slave has taken care of him. He has ministered to him. He has helped him all along the way. And wouldn't you know it, Philemon, the slave's name is Onesimus. Turns out he's yours. Oh, my gosh. Let's look at Philemon as Paul continues. He says, so, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Remember, Paul is Philemon's spiritual father and brother, and he's Onesimus' spiritual father and brother. And he's like, you got to look at him in a new way. You are brothers. You are one. You are partners in the gospel. He says, if he's done anything wrong to you, of course, knowing that he had, if he's done anything wrong to you or owes you anything, you charge it to me. I'm writing this with my own hand. I love this. He says, I'll pay it back, uh, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I mean, I don't want to dig it in too far, but um, it's because of me that you got saved. He says, I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you and the Lord. Oh, he says, won't you refresh my heart in Christ? 
It's like, won't you respond in a different way? Because you're not the same person now that you're in Christ. Won't you refresh, refresh my heart? Bless my heart. Do something different. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. No pressure there. No pressure. Everyone is hearing this message. Can you imagine what the slaves are thinking as they sit on the edge of their seat and wonder what's going to happen. Is he going to have his runaway slave put to death? Is he going to beat him in front of everyone to teach them a lesson? I love that Paul resists saying, well, not to mention, you owe me your very new life. What's at the center of this conflict is not only that Onesimus ran away from home, but at the center of the conflict is Philemon's belief that Onesimus was less than, and that this whole cast of people were less than. You know, we're made in the image of God, each one of us. It is corrupt that we would consider someone as less than, someone as an other, someone as an object. I was uh, driving down Palm Beach Boulevard the other day, and you know, there's a little bit of construction, and there was a street coming up, and so I was slowing down, and some person behind me, a man, some person behind me was laying on the horn and laying on the horn, and then whipped around me and signaled me, um, you know, how that went, looking at me with rage, and I'm going to tell you, I was not considering him a child of God and a person of worth (laughs) in that moment. He was the object of my rage. I wanted to give it right back because he deserved it. And that's really a minor thing. That's really a minor thing. In moments of conflict, we can see people as objects. And friends, you can't forgive an object. You're talking about people. Flesh and blood people whom Jesus loves, even though it might be really, really hard for us. And you can't be reconciled to an object. Only people can receive our forgiveness. Um, There's a book called The Anatomy of Peace, and it says in every moment we choose to see others as people like ourselves or as objects. They either count like we do or they don't. The challenge of Philemon is for him to see Onesimus as an equal in Christ, as a partner in the gospel, not as one of them, not as a slave, not as property, not as an object. For Philemon, the rest, the root of the conflict was was viewing a person as an object, and and I got to tell you something, in Christ, We are all on equal ground. We're all on equal ground. Um, Look at Galatians 3, 26, 28. This is what the Apostle Paul said. So in Christ Jesus, let's read this together. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. We're one in Christ. Christ is our identity, and if our identity is anything else, we're in trouble. 
if uh, we think we're part of the haves or the have-nots, our identity is not in Christ. We cannot, we cannot think of us and them if it's blue and red, and you know what I'm talking about, if it's black or white or brown, if it's orange or purple, it doesn't matter. As followers of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, the blood of Jesus Christ, the price he paid to make us one, no matter our differences in things that don't matter, we are one in Jesus Christ. Paul's saying there's no labels when it comes to children of God. So when I'm in Christ, there is no us and them. And that's kind of a barometer, right? That's a barometer. If I think anybody, any people group, anybody with any belief system, anybody who looks or acts different than I is less than, I have stepped away from being in Christ. I have stepped away. When I'm in Christ, there is no room for judging others. When I am in Christ, there is no room for bearing a grudge, for holding on to a resentment. When I'm in Christ, there is no possibility of me thinking that I am better than anyone else. When I am in Christ, I begin to see others as children of God. And friends, they may be broken. They may be shattered. They may be, they may be sinful as all get out. But they are not beyond the grace of God. God still wants to restore them. But I want to say this again. When we deal with people who are broken and shattered who've hurt us deeply, do we want to take that on and just wear it ourselves and fan the flames of bitterness and fan the flames of anger and fan the flames of resentment until that is our identity? I'm a victim of. Or do we want to, do we want to be identified as free people, as free people, free in Christ, free of all of that bondage and all of those encumbrances. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about what happened with Philemon and Onesimus. Well, um, it is believed in church history that Onesimus eventually, this is amazing, that the runaway slave eventually became the bishop of the church of Ephesus, which means that Philemon not only forgave Onesimus, but released him for joyful service to the church. Praise God. Praise God. You know who I think got released? Philemon. No longer in bondage to anger, no longer imprisoned by resentment, no longer carrying the burden of a sin that someone else committed, a burden he was never meant to carry, getting weighed down. I don't want to be imprisoned by someone else's bad behavior, do you? I really, really don't. So, as I preach on forgiveness every time, I, it is so hard and so common um, for each of us to say, preacher, you have no idea what happened to me. And you're absolutely right. Because we live in a broken world and is full of broken people, myself included. We have all hurt people and we have all been hurt by people. And I, I was hesitating this morning to talk about this. Um, but I was thinking about some of the more difficult things I've had to forgive, and one uh, was the man who molested me my entire fourth grade. I needed to be free 
of the bitterness and the resentment that I carried, and I carried it for years, and I was never free. And, and I remember vividly where I was when I was shaking like a leaf saying, I have every right to hang on to this, and what he did was wrong, but I will no longer allow that man's sin to control my life and imprison me. It was hard. And we've all got stuff. We've all got stuff. And I want to encourage you to be, at the very least, willing to become willing to give that to God and wait and see what he does. So Jesus came and went to the cross and, and gave us a great example of forgiveness. I, I am not Jesus and none of us are too, but even while he was being crucified, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then he made a way for you and I to be forgiven for anything we've ever done and anything we'll ever do. And then he gave us the capacity, even shaking, to forgive someone else. 